Elephants All Rise and Sing are in Troy, and it is found in the middle of your bulletins. And we sing it through twice. <laughs> Father in heaven, we come into your presence recognizing you as the great creator of the universe. Lord, we want to thank you too for the gift of salvation that you have given to us in your beloved son. And this morning we're thankful for the special work that he's in, involved in right now in the heavenly temple as our merciful high priest. Lord, it is so good to know that we can come to him 24-7, 365, and, and he is there to listen to the burdens of our heart. You are so worthy of our worship, and you have given us this day to remind us, to remind us that we are not saved by anything we do or say, but we're saved through the holy history of Jesus. And if we appreciate the suffering that he endured on our behalf, it leads to heartfelt, non-meritorious obedience to your will, not because we feel pressure to, but it's our love response for the great love that you have for each and every one of us. We invite you here through your Holy Spirit. We want to thank you so much for everything you do for us day in and day out. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Yeah, I'm going to do one. Again. We have a baptism today, and I am so, so excited that Janie was led to our church by the Holy Spirit. She had been watching 3ABN. And she was convicted after hearing Doug Batchelor talk about the Seventh-day Sabbath. And so I'm, I'm thankful that you chose to come this morning to witness her baptism. But she will become a part of the family of God. Amen. Not that she's going to be perfect. I remember reading in a book called Steps to Christ, we shall often weep at the feet of Jesus for our shortcomings, but we are not forsaken by God. Do you remember when you were two or three years of age learning to walk? Do you remember ever falling when you were learning to walk? You were not needing words of condemnation, were you? But you were needing one of your loving parents to pick you up and to encourage you. And that's why we exist as a church. She's a babe in Christ, and we are there to, to cheer her on and support her with our prayers and with our words of encouragement. So I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit led her here. I'm thankful for such a wonderful church family. So, pending on the baptism, in a few minutes, do I hear a motion to accept her into the church fellowship? Oh, look at that, man. We got Elvin way up there in the booth. 
raised his hand. Is there a second to the motion? Okay, all in favor. Hallelujah. Let us stand again and praise the Lord with hymn number seven, The Lord in Zion Reigneth. And we'll sing all three verses. You can hear me now. What would we do without our Lord and Savior? I'm reminded of the story in Luke chapter 15 of the lost sheep. There is no story in sacred scripture of a sheep looking for its shepherd. But I am thankful that there are several stories in the Bible of a shepherd looking for a lost sheep. And there's no story in God's word of a lost coin looking for its owner. But there is a story of an owner looking for a lost coin. Now, i got to be careful, Bill. Can you pull this away? Uh, if this were to drop in here, <laughs> we'd be having two funerals. <laughs> Do it this way. It's happened before, it's believe it or not. I would move it back, yeah. I just don't want to take a chance. Okay. So I'm thankful for God's divine initiative, actively pursuing each and every one of us every day. And I'm thankful that Janie has a heart for the Lord. And I'm not sure if you would like to say anything. Um, I but just, don't grab that. <laughs> I won't grab it. Okay. I just want to say thank you for letting me come to your church and accepting me as one of you all. And I love this church and I love every one of you. I do. And I'm so grateful. Amen. And I love Jesus most of all. Right. And because you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are here. He has paid the ultimate price to atone for your sins. And the good news is, in the heavenly sanctuary, the new covenant temple, we are told in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, My little children, these things I write to you, that you sin not, but if any man sins... 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And um, that is what I'm so thankful for. Remember that God is able to keep you from falling, but if you do fall, you have an advocate with the Father. So, because you love the Lord uh -huh. and you want to join the fellowship of the Seventh day Adventist Church, now bend your legs. <laughs> okay. okay. Ready? I now, as a minister of the gospel, baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We love you, Janie. Amen. One more time. Amen. Amen. It is now time uh, for uh, returning um, tithes and offerings. And uh, so I would just ask that uh, you would um, think of the blessings God has given you. And our special offering for today is uh, for the uh, North American Division of Women's Ministries. And uh, so as you are so inclined, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Lord, for uh, the celebration of baptism. And um, we're so thankful for Janie's commitment and decision. Father, now uh, uh, we know that you bless us richly in so many ways. And now we return to you um, uh, to take care of uh, the spreading of the gospel, uh, take care of our church home and the different ministries of outreach. Um, and especially uh, for the women's ministries. Lord, please uh, bless us and uh, bless our hearts as we seek to return to you that which um, is yours. We thank you, Lord. All things belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're uh, about to have our children's story. Before we uh, announce that, I'd like to just say, uh, in your pews, in the backs of the benches there, are blue cards. And uh, in, a, in a short time, we're going to have a, a season of prayer we call Garden of Prayer. And so if you have a special prayer request, whether it be a thank you, a praise, or uh, an actual prayer request petition, uh, we take those and collect those blue cards up here up front. And uh, then we give those to our church family's prayer warriors, and they are kept um, anonymous, and they won't be announced in public, so you can bear your soul. And uh, our, our mighty prayer warriors will lovingly pray uh, over those prayer requests. At this time, our uh, pastor's uh, beautiful and lovely wife, Marie, is going to come and give us our children's story. So uh, any uh, children um, ages uh, zero to 99, 
uh, that want to come up and hear a good story, uh, please uh, go to the back of the church sanctuary and grab your little baskets for collecting the lamb's offering and uh, make sure that we hit uh, the center aisle and the outside aisles. And uh, you young men back there, you're not too old to go get them baskets. You go get them baskets. <laughs> to show you what is this what is it what is that huh oh I heard somebody say it what is that look at him what is this An elephant that's right now the African bush elephant that's even more specific you're right now does he look small this is a giant one. He's really big. Can you see how big he is? All right. I want to tell you about a very big elephant, okay? Now, <clears throat> first off, sometimes in life we have obstacles or trials that are huge, right? and we don't know what to do. Sometimes we even have small difficulties and we're not sure what to do, right? But there's a text in the Bible that I'm reminded of, and this is what it says, Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. All right, so remember that verse as I tell you this story. Be still and know that I am God. When I was a teenager, I lived in Africa. I lived in the middle country of the bottom half of Africa called Zambia. Not far from where we lived, maybe three or four hour drive, was Manapool's National Park in the country of Zimbabwe. And in Manapool's, it has thousands and thousands of acres, a lot of animals find refuge because they cannot be hunted in that area. So they're protected. So we got to go camping there one time. So we took with us our pop-up camper that would bed four people. And then we took a tent for two more people because there were six in my family. And we set up our pop-up in the camping area of Monopools. But there was no fence to keep out the animals. They could walk in and out of where we were camping. And so our campsite was like this. It had a huge baobab tree. A baobab tree looks like the roots are in the air. That's what it looks like. And then there's a huge trunk. Bigger around than my arms can reach was the trunk of that baobab tree. It's a huge, huge tree. So we had a big baobab tree in our campsite. And then we had about four or five feet from the edge of the baobab tree 
and then we set up our tent, and then a few more feet, and we set up the pop-up camper. So we drove around during the day to see what kind of wild animals we would see. On the road, we saw two leopards. One was right in the middle of the road, just laying there on the cool sand, and the other one was kind of in the, in the brush. And we also saw a pride of lions eating a wildebeest that they had killed. We saw lots of wildebeests with little birds sitting on them, pecking off the bugs. And we saw lots of types of antelope and deer. And uh, there were also giraffes in the park. We didn't get to see one that day. Uh, there were also crocodiles in the pools and hippos and there were rhinoceroses so it was a very interesting day well that night um, in that part of africa we're 2,000 miles south of the equator and the days were long during that time of day so we were already in bed but it was still light outside and uh, my sisters and my parents were in the pop-up and all of a sudden one of my sisters said there's an elephant coming to our campsite and my brother and I were in the tent, mind you. Well, so uh, my dad's like, well, just be, be still. Remember my verse, be still and know that I am God. So he's like, be still. So we were still and we were quiet. And my brother and I are laying on our backs in the tent, looking up. And guess what we saw out the window? the belly of an elephant <laughs> so this elephant had three choices he could walk around our campsite he could walk over our tent or he could walk between the baobab tree and our tent so we are sitting there hardly breathing as we look up and see his belly his belly was above the top of our tent and our tent was about this tall so we were quiet and we were waiting now recently in my devotions I've been reading the book of Joshua it's very interesting in just one or two chapters there are these phrases it said one phrase the Lord fought for Israel the other phrase the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel and another phrase, the Lord delivered them. But in each case, the Israelites did something. They asked God what to do, they did their part, and the Lord did the rest. So my brother and I were laying there looking at the belly of an elephant, and we were being very still and quiet. <clears throat> Waiting to see what that elephant would do. And you know what he decided to do? He decided to go right between the baobab and our tent. And then we could breathe. But life is like that. We can have all our plans laid out. We can be following our plans like we did because we spent our day looking at all the animals all day, right? And then we got ready for bed and we laid down and then what happened? The unexpected came, right? So we did our part, we were still, and the Lord God delivered us. And it's that way in life, boys and girls, something will come up that you didn't plan. And remember, be still and know that I am God. I will deliver you. You can go back to your seats. Amen. Amen. What do you think, Hannah? Are you ready to go live in a tent? On the, uh, my, my kid's crazy about animals, so she hears this story from Marie about being able to go camping among the animals, and she's probably sitting over there coveting or something. 
It is time for our garden of prayer uh, for our church family. It's a special time to uh, come together and, and we kneel together in prayer to our God. And we thank Him and we love Him and we worship Him and we present our petitions to Him. Um, so I'm going to place my Bible down here and uh, you can bring your blue prayer cards up there and lay them in the Bible. And, and I'll give them to Jane and the prayer warriors. And thank you, Jane. And uh, uh, just so that you know, at the end of our time of prayer, there's a little song that we sing. It's The words are also in your bulletin, just so that you know not to jump right up. So, uh, so let's go ahead and have our garden of prayer. special blessing today that I'd like to share with you. Over the last couple of months, I've been trying to get a job at San Francis, and on Tuesday, I finally signed the papers. I'll be working night shifts three days a week with my mother. Amen. Yeah, that's a blessing. Amen. You know, I got a personal uh, philosophy that however long you've prayed for something, when we get the answer, whether it's exactly what we wanted or not, we should pray the same amount of time in thanks and gratitude. It helps your heart. It helps your soul. It helps your heart. As far as possible, let's uh, kneel before our Lord. Most holy God, tender, merciful Father, our hearts are now united together by your Holy Spirit that is in this place. And we lift you up and thank you and praise you. We thank you for the gift of how you've expressed yourself through your son Jesus. And we're so thankful, Lord, that we have our church home and our church family here together and the guests that are here. And we praise you for uh, Janie's baptism, Lord. We just praise you. We know the angels, the mighty angels are singing to you. Holy, holy, holy. We're thankful for this Sabbath day that's cut off from the rest of the week, every week, that we can cultivate in our hearts and in our minds, just blocking out the craziness of the world. We thank you, Lord, for the many rich blessings you give us, a new job. We thank you, Lord, for our friendships and our, our families and our homes. We thank you for our jobs. We thank you, Lord, that we know that you hear and you see uh, any struggles that we have. We know that you hear every prayer request in the room. We know from your scripture, not because we feel good all the time, but because you said so. And for that, we are grateful. Uh, many here, Lord, are uh, possibly have family members or loved ones, friends, who might be struggling, struggling with some sort of uh, physical or even emotional um, uh, concern. And so we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would, would uh, intervene on our behalf. We intermingle our praises and thanksgivings with the fragrance of the incense of your Son's sacrifice. In Jesus, we reach out to you and ask for your blessing on these families that may have one of these types of struggles. We ask for your blessing, Lord. If there's a miracle, we will make sure to give you all the credit. Lord, if a miracle is not within your will, then we would ask that uh, you would bless their, their uh, medical staff that with uh, wisdom and skill and compassion. We ask, Lord, for those who have had recent loss, uh, Lord, that you would bring comfort to their families, their hearts. Let them know uh, and, and lean on the hope of the promise of Jesus' soon coming and that there will be a great reunion at the resurrection, at the second coming, the promised coming of King Jesus. 
Lord, we also ask now uh, that uh, you would bless uh, those who defend our right, our rights and our freedoms uh, to worship you. Um, we ask, Lord, that you would bless uh, the craziness of the politics of our country. We thank you, Lord, for this country that you have preordained to be here. Father, we ask also that you would bless first responders, uh, our police, our law enforcement, and um, emergency medical staff, etc. Lord, we're thankful for that. We're thankful for them and ask for your blessing on their families. Lord, uh, many of our families have someone that we're praying for. And Lord, help us to find the compassion and the wisdom uh, to find the most effective way to be of influence, to answer our own prayers on their behalf, to that they may find the joy that comes from having a deep and deeper growing relationship with you. And now, Father, we ask that your mighty Holy Spirit be poured out in fullness upon our church family and upon our Pastor David as he presents to us the great expression of your love through your Holy Spirit. Bless us now, Lord, as we continue to worship you in service. Bless us throughout this Sabbath day. And bless us as we eventually leave this place. We're thankful for you. We thank you. And we praise you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Brother Tony is going to be bringing us our special music. Good morning. Can I use this? I'll go ahead and use this mic if that's okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, number 648, yeah. I like to do a couple of uh, patriotic songs during the month of uh, July, but also uh, this one, uh, since it's in the hymn book, it's also spiritual. If you want to follow along, it's number 648. Uh, this song was, um, it's my understanding that it was uh, Princess Diana's favorite song, and it was played at her funeral, and it was also played at... Uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, funeral, even though uh, some of the words would seem to be um, a patriotic song directed at England, but really it's about the, uh, the country that we're going to be living in someday after Jesus comes and cleans up this big mess. <laughs>
scripture reading is Isaiah 45 verse 8. Rain down you heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let them bring forth salvation and let righteousness spring up together. I the Lord have created it. And the church says Amen. Amen. Good morning everyone. Hasn't it been an exciting Sabbath already with the baptism? Thank you for the scripture reading, Kim, and the song. Tony, Tony always sings from the heart. I appreciate him so much. I didn't get a chance to hear the children's story, but I imagine it was pretty good. Many of you know I like history, and I especially like Reformation history and Adventist history. Now, some time ago, I did uh, a sermon on how the Sabbath came to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Sabbath came to the Advent believers through a dedicated Christian by the name of Rachel Oaks, and she shared the Sabbath truth with a Methodist minister called Old, remember his name? Frederick Wheeler. Then Frederick Wheeler shared it with a Baptist minister, Thomas Preble. And then Thomas Preble shared the Sabbath truth with Joseph Bates. And that's how we got the Sabbath truth. But today I would like to look at another important historical event that occurred within our denomination. And to begin, I would like to invite you to bow your heads for an additional word of prayer. Father in heaven, give us wisdom, give us understanding as we seek to learn the message that you would have us know and understand. We believe that you are wanting to come back soon, but you are waiting for your people. And so today, through your Holy Spirit, communicate to us in a language that we can understand. And we will give you the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. The year was 1888. The place was Minneapolis, Minnesota. The event was the General Conference. In his infinite mercy, God raised up two men. These men were called by God to feed the flock. Yes, their minds were enlightened by the Holy Spirit. And they delivered manna from heaven's bakery to the 90 delegates assembled in Minneapolis. Their message was to be given to the world. It was the beginning of the loud cry of the latter rain. And it was to prepare men and women for translation, not death. 
So who were these two men that God had raised up and what was the focal point of their message? The two men were Alonzo Trevor Jones and Ellett Joseph Wagner and the focal point of their message was Christ's infinite love for the human family and his gift of righteousness to them. Now another facet of their message was the new covenant. Their teaching on the new covenant was riveted in God's unfailing, God's what? Unfailing promises to the human family. Now as most of you probably know, there's much confusion today regarding the old and new covenant among Christians. When looking at the two covenants, most Christians believe people who lived during the Old Testament were saved by a life of good works. But after the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, everyone now is saved by grace. Well, may I suggest to you this morning, this understanding of the covenants has no scriptural support. So then, what is the new covenant? Well, to begin our exploration of this very important subject, I would like to invite you at this time to turn to Hebrews chapter 13, a very, very important scripture verse in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13, and once you turn to Hebrews chapter 13, drop down to verse 20. Hebrews chapter 13, and we will look at verse 20 together. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. The Word of God says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of what kind of covenant? The blood of the everlasting covenant. Make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, to understand this verse, you and I must go back in time. Sometime back in the days of eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit came together for a council meeting. Now, in this special council meeting, they planned the creation of man. In planning the creation of man, because of their foreknowledge, they saw the entrance of what? Sin. It was at this time that Jesus stepped forward and pledged to give his life for Adam and his descendants. Through his life, through his death and resurrection, Jesus would reconcile the human family unto himself. Remember, it's called the blood of the everlasting covenant everlasting covenant. An agreement was made with the Godhead way back in the days of eternity that our beloved Savior would save the human race no matter the cost or expense to the Godhead. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Romans chapter 5, verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were, past tense, reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now, it must have been a struggle, as you can imagine, for the Father to send His Son into the world. A world that would reject Him, a world that would laugh at Him, a world that would mock Him, a world that would abuse Him, and a world that would end up crucifying Him. So why did the Father consent to send His beloved Son? You and I know this verse, don't we? We have it memorized. John 3, 16, First, God so agape the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever 
believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life John 3:16 Now two Sabbaths ago I revealed to you what genuine faith was Review and Herald July 24 1888 We are told in that periodical you may truly say you believe when you have an appreciation for what it cost the son of God to save you from your sins Genuine faith is more than just a mental assent to doctrine. Paul would write in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. For with the what? The heart, the cardia, with our, with our thoughts, with our intellect, and with our emotions. And you and I cannot understand the love of God unless the Holy Spirit is controlling our mind. We find that in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, right? We have to have this Holy Spirit to appreciate the ignominious death that Jesus went through and suffered for our eternal salvation. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Now, how many parents would want to send their child to a foreign country, well knowing that in that foreign country they would be verbally abused, they would be physically abused, and maybe, in a sense, sexually abused? Would you, as a parent, send your child to a foreign country if you had this knowledge before time that your daughter, your son, would be abused, rejected, and mocked, and ridiculed? Would you? I would like, no way, not going there. That's my child. My value system as a father, I provide and I protect. I didn't hear any amens from the, the fathers in here. Are you asleep? Now, from these two verses, we learn that the foundation of the new covenant is God's redeeming love for the human race. And there is a major difference between human love and God's divine love. Our human love is based on a value system of outward beauty and inward goodness. But aren't you thankful that while we were yet sinners, Christ demonstrated his agape love toward us? But what is the new covenant? Well, before I answer this question, I would like to look at the old covenant with you for a minute. The old covenant needs to be understood in the context of the history of ancient Israel. So let's go back in time. Is that all right? Let's go back in time. Israel has just set up camp at the base of Mount Sinai. And their fearless leader, who is, by the way, Moses, climbs to the top of the mountain to commune with God. Now, sometime later, Moses leaves the presence of God and descends the mount. Once in the valley, he gathers the people together and delivers a heaven-born message to them. Now the response of the people to the message gives us a glimpse, an insight, into their warped understanding of salvation. How did they respond? They said, all that you have said, we will do. In our Sabbath school class this morning, Roger did a phenomenal job. He said, go back and read Romans chapter 7. And count how many times the Apostle Paul uses the word I or me. And then go to Romans chapter 8. It's not about him. It's about what God can do through the Holy Spirit in and through you. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about God. Well, once in the valley, he gathers the people together, and as I mentioned, he delivers a very special message to them. And their response was again, what? All that you have said, we will do. Now, what happened shortly after ancient Israel promised to obey God? What did they do? They built a golden calf and danced around it. Now, this leads to a very important question. 
Why did the Old Covenant fail? It failed because it was based on man promising to do something great for God. We will obey you. We will be faithful to you. We will do exactly what you want us to do. Now in the book Steps to Christ, the author says, all our promises are like what? Ropes of sand. Your promises to God and my promises to God are like ropes of sand. The message that came to us back in 1888 was don't make promises to God, but believe the promises that He has made to you. Why? Because the creative power that brought the universe into existence is found in the Word of God, and the Word of God is self-fulfilling to those who believe. Amen. Do you see the difference? You and I are weak and feeble. We have no power whatsoever to do the will of God apart from divine intervention. Yes, we will obey you. We will be faithful to you. We will do exactly what you want us to do. Now, were they sincere? They were sincere, but sincerely wrong. Now, let me illustrate this point. Let's say you decide to take a rock climbing class. Let's say you don't live here in Indiana, but Colorado, and for some reason you are intrigued with the sport of rock climbing. And so you sign up for a rock climbing class. And your instructor takes you to the top of a very steep escarpment. And you're learning to repel on this particular day. And so you look at the rope that he is connecting to your harness and you discover it's made out of sand. <laughs> and so you began to question your instructor. You look into his face and say, uh, 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 will this rope really hold me as I descend 300 feet from the top of this escarpment? He said, well, yeah, I, I used Elmer's glue and a little bit of super glue. It should hold. Now, how many of you would say, okay, okay, I'm going to try it? All our promises to God are like what? Ropes of sand. Now, let's look at the new covenant. There are four pillars to the new covenant. These pillars to the new covenant are found in Jeremiah chapter 31. And let's begin in verse 31. What book? Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 31. Jeremiah 31, the weeping prophet who warned ancient Israel of coming judgment, wrote some very profound words in verse 31. The word of God says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make what kind of covenant? A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which, what? They broke, though I was a husband to them. Remember, in one sermon... I shared with you there are different ways to read the Old Testament scriptures. You can read it as master, slave, father, child, or husband, wife. Now God is relating to his people as husband, and they are his bride, his wife. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. I was their lover, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Now we come, now we come to the four pillars of the new covenant. In the middle of verse 33, it says, I will put my law, where? In their minds and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 34, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will 
forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more so then what are the four pillars to the new covenant that are mentioned in these two verses well the first one is sanctification God has promised that he will write his law where in our hearts so when we talk about the Ten Commandment law we must include this new covenant concept God has promised now does God lie does he give us promises and then withhold them God has says I will take my law and I will write it in your heart and in your mind now I believe many people have a limited understanding of God's Ten Commandment law and I've tried to convey this to you that every command there is a negative but on the flip side there is also the positive there's the minimum there's the maximum and the commandment that says thou shalt not kill you and I can feel pretty good about ourselves right I've never killed anyone but Jesus said if you have bitterness anger resentment prejudice within your heart if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from you, you and I would actually commit the sentiments that were buried in our heart. But what is the opposite of taking life? Giving life. Now, Jesus was a commandment keeper, wasn't he? The Messianic Psalm found in chapter 40, verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is where? In my heart. Isaiah chapter 42, Jesus came to exalt and magnify the law. Now the religious leaders in this day and age thought that he was soft on sin because they didn't understand that the foundational principle of God's moral law is what? Love. So the commandment that said, thou shalt not kill, the opposite of taking life is what? Giving life. And as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what do you see Jesus doing? I'm going to be redundant, but I'm going to say it again. Jairus, you lost your 12-year-old daughter. You were really connected to her. You love her. I will go and raise her to life. What was Jesus doing in that narrative? He was giving life. What about the woman caught in the act of adultery, weighed down with shame and guilt? How did Jesus give her life? By saying, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here because I am your lover of your soul. I am your creator and redeemer, and I soon will be in the new covenant temple interceding on your behalf. You're of infinite value to me, and I want to remove that shame, that guilt, those feelings of condemnation that are weighing you down. You're forgiven. He gave her spiritual life. And what is the opposite of stealing? Giving. And don't we see that Jesus gave everything? So instead of feeling smug when we look yeah, we keep the commandments in the Sabbath, we should say, woe is me. I have fallen short of God's glory. We have a skewed understanding, I believe, at even of the commandments. Are you tracking? Do you, you don't have to agree with me. That's fine. So the first new covenant promise is God taking his law and writing it where? And so what will God's end time people look like? We, we know the narrative, don't we? In, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, prior to the second coming, John in vision sees a group of people who keep the commandments of God. But what will they look like? They'll look just like Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Any more amens? Are you awake? Hey, maybe we need to turn the temperature down to about 50 degrees. My wife always says it's really cold in here. I like it cold, by the way. We have a feather blanket, and I don't know how she can sleep under the feather blanket in the summer, but my wife does. Even in the winter, I can't sleep under the feather blanket. I have a pillow, because I'm really bony, so I have a pillow between my legs, one between my arms, and one on my head. So I have to sleep with three pillows. And if I go to a hotel and there's not three pillows for me to sleep with, it's miserable for me. Now let's look at the second pillar. 
The second pillar is reconciliation. I will be their God and they shall be my what? They will be my... What does that refer to? One word, reconciliation. God is not harboring any angry feelings towards His children. The problem is not in the heart of God. The problem is in your heart and my heart. We hold the enmity in our mind towards Him. So He comes to us and said, Listen, I'm your Creator. I'm your Redeemer. I'm working 24-7, 365 to get you in heaven, not keep you out. I'm on your side. I'm on your side. Reconciliation. Now what about the other two pillars that are mentioned in verse 34? Well, I'm glad you asked. The first one is missions. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me. That indicates that God's people have been successful in sharing the gospel with the world. And then the last one, the fourth one, justification. I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will what? Remember no more. God wants us in close, intimate fellowship with Him. Now, let me ask you a question. Why sanctification, reconciliation, missions, then justification? I thought God forgives us, and then He sanctifies us. Well, remember, we're reading Jeremiah. And who was Jeremiah? Was he a Christian? He was a Jew, he was a Hebrew, and Hebrews don't reason from cause to effect. They reason from effect to cause. So that's why it's written that way. I learned that in seminary. I've learned, I learned some good stuff in seminary. And that was probably one of the most profound things I learned, because I always read in the Old Testament, it seems like it's backwards from the writings of the Apostle Paul. Now, there are some other principles of the New Covenant that you and I need to grasp. The New Covenant is based upon God's unfailing, self-sacrificing, everlasting, unchanging love, not man's faltering, self-centered, conditional love. And we looked at this verse before. Look at, um, or verses, Romans chapter 5, probably... My favorite passage in the Word of God, Romans chapter 5. I know my history. I know my spirit of rebellion. And I know what God did in order to redeem me. And I still have a lot to learn. Kicked out of school, chasing, on the chase, going to bars, drinking, drugs, and all that. I am the least worthy to be standing here. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Those who were living their life without God, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But, 180 degree turn, that conjunction but is so important. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet what? Sinners, Christ died the death of the cross. That ignominious death, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his... How are you saved? Yeah. By his life and his death. Hallelujah. So the new covenant is based upon God's everlasting, unfailing, unchanging love for the human family. It's also based upon God seeking after man and not man seeking after God. Now some of you might be saying, well, are there not verses in the Bible that talk about the importance of seeking after God? Well, may I suggest to you this morning, the seeking after God that you and I do is still based upon God's divine initiative. Why? 
Because God pours out His Spirit upon you and the work of the Holy Spirit is to lead you to Jesus. You just responded to the Holy Spirit. And as I mentioned, there's no story in the Bible of a, of a lost sheep looking for a shepherd. And there's no story of a lost coin looking for its owner. Hey, I'm here. Hey, uh, owner, fine. I'm, uh, you know. No, there's none. You see what I'm saying? In fact, the Apostle Paul would write in Romans 3, verse 11, there is no one who understands. There is none who seeks after God. What does it say? There is no one who seeks after God. So when I came home from a party at 5.30 in the morning and I collapsed on my bed and I was so under the influence of alcohol that the ceiling was spinning, who was seeking after me? I wasn't looking for God. But the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart, are you having fun? Is this really fun? And I said, no, there has to be more to life than this. But I'm thankful that God was pursuing me. Now, the new covenant is not based on God, uh, man holding God's hand, but God holding man's hand. Now, let me give you an illustration. Let's say this is an escarpment. And down below, there's a thousand feet drop. And let's say I have my young boy, Caleb, and he wants to look kind of over the edge. Now what, first of all, I wouldn't do it, please. I don't want to be compared with Michael Jackson who held his child over the balcony, okay? So my, my son is standing on the edge. You got the picture. Now he's holding my hand and I'm holding his hand. But it, it, is it his strength that keeps him from falling over the edge? Or is it daddy's strength? Let's say he's two years of age. Whose strength keeps him from falling over the edge? So the new covenant is not based upon you holding God's hand, but a belief that God is holding your hand. And what about our relationship? The New Covenant is based on God initiating and maintaining a relationship with you, not you maintaining and initiating a relationship with Him. How do I know? Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4 reads, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear the what? The learned. Now, don't misunderstand me, what I'm about to say. I spend time every day reading God's Word and praying to my Creator, Redeemer, and Mediator. That is not my initiative. The Holy Spirit prompts me and leads me into that relationship. Now, who makes the initiative in a relationship? Well, we're living, this is, let's say back in the 1940s and 50s. Okay, who initiates a relationship? The, if you live back in the, some of you probably know what I'm talking about. Who initiates a relationship, the man or the woman? The man. And so we, the bride of Christ, initiate and maintain the relationship with him? No. God gets the honor and credit. I can't boast of the fact that I spend time every day reading the Bible and praying, but the Holy Spirit speaks to my heart. He awakens me morning by morning, and He, he prompts me, He leads me to a study of the Word, to a, a relationship with Him. But He has initiated the relationship, and He maintains the relationship. Do you see the big difference? I'm not smart enough, I'm not clever enough, I'm not wise enough. The new covenant is based upon God's promises, not man's promises. It's based upon God's faithfulness, not man's faithlessness. And finally, the new covenant is based on much more abounding grace, not much more abounding sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where sin abounds, 
grace, God's charis, His mercy, His love, His kindness, much more abounds. And it is through His grace that you and I can overcome temptation and sin. There was a wise lady by the name of Ellen who wrote in a book called The Desire of Ages, it's not the hope or reward or the fear of punishment that motivates the disciples of Christ to follow Him. Why? Those are egocentric motivational factors. God is, in His love, is not coercive and manipulative, is He? Not at all. Only by love is love awakened. Only by what? And again, human love and divine love cannot be compared. They can only be contrasted. Only contrasted. Much more abounding grace. Now let me give you a warning about the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant leads to bondage. It leads to a spirit of Phariseeism, self-righteousness. And what do we know about Phariseeism? Pharisees drive people out of the church. Oh, you're not, you're not dressed right, or you're not eating right, or you, and, and then you start picking. And some of you maybe have children not in the church, or maybe some of you at one time were members of the Seventh-day Adventist church, but you were hammered with the red books. I apologize, and I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because a distorted portrait of God was given to you. And I apologize. Please reconsider. The Old Covenant leads to bondage. It leads to a spirit of self-righteousness. It generates a narcissistic worldview that I'm at the center. This will keep your moral compass pure. Acts 10, verse 38, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was filled with what? The Holy Spirit. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and with power, dunamis. And he went about doing good and helping all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. It wasn't about him. He who is chief among you, let him be your what? Servant. This is the highest plateau that you and I can achieve is to serve others. You know what? Young people are looking for happiness. And I have a boy that's looking for happiness. And my daughter has found happiness in serving others. She just flew to India. She saves up her money not to buy clothes and things to adorn her body. But she just flew to India and it's in the monsoon rainy, rainy season. And she sent us a picture. There was like two feet of water on the roads. She had to walk seven miles in mud to get to the orphanage. And my daughter has polyesthetic fibrous dysplasia. She has tumors in her bones that cause her excruciating pain. And my wife said to me this morning, why, why would she do that? because she loves those children. And then she sent us a beautiful picture with her surrounded by these children, young adults. We have millennials here. It doesn't matter if you're young and old. I would like to encourage you to go on a foreign mission trip. It will open up your eyes. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and helping all. Atheists? Mm-hmm. Buddhist, probably, yep, yep. Agnostic, oh yeah. He didn't ask, what is your religious persuasion? If you think like me, then I'm willing to help you. <laughs> That's, no, no, no. He reached everyone. So the old covenant leads to bondage. It leads to a spirit of self-righteousness. It generates a narcissistic worldview. And it puts you and I at the center stage. And it leads to an unforgiving spirit where you then end up using coercion and manipulation to get your way. Now, in closing, I want to read something to you. Now you might be asking, we're going to do a series on the latter rain. And uh, 
I just want you to go back and look at Joel chapter 2, verse 23. The latter rain comes through the message of righteousness by faith. It comes through what? Because in the margin and in the Hebrew language, when it talks about latter rain and early rain, the Hebrew word is a preacher of righteousness that delivers and proclaims the message of righteousness. That's huge. So you and I can pray for the latter rain, but the latter rain was knocking on our door well over a hundred years ago. Now in closing, listen to this profound, profound statement. The Lord in His great mercy sent a most precious message to His people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior. The uplifted what? Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all of God's commandments. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless, the what? The priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. I'm not commanding that we give this message to the world. God has commanded that this message go to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of the Spirit in a large measure. May God bless you as you consider His Word today. Let's all stand and for our closing hymn, sing number 326. Open my eyes. Invite the Holy Spirit to be with you when you're reading your Bible. 326, all verses.
just one quick announcement. Hey, we are doing a huge evangelistic campaign in 2020, and I would like you all to be on board. So if you have time this evening at 7 o'clock, what time? Irvington Church. Irvington Church. They're going to have a training program and cast the vision. We're going to have three evangelistic campaigns going all over this conference in the spring of 2020. We have the Cole Porters. By the way, they're doing a phenomenal job. If you see them, please shake their hand, give them a hug, and thank them so much. They are the Marines. Someone said that, and I don't know who that was. They're the Marines. They're on the front line in this hot, sultry, sticky weather. So I, I want to thank them. But they have a list of Bible study cards. And I didn't share this with you. We're getting a Bible worker. We're, get, we're getting a Bible worker. Isn't that awesome? And do you know who the Bible worker is? Yeah, yeah me. No, I was just kidding. <laughs> we're getting a Bible worker, Caleb Philibrew. Do you know who he is? He was a young man in prison here in Indiana, and somehow he got a great controversy. He read the great controversy. He was convicted on the Sabbath. He came to the Carmel Church. My wife and invited him and his wife over to our house, and we started studying the Bible. Then he went to Pastor Eric Frecking's evangelistic series, and I had the privilege of baptizing him. Then I encouraged him, hey, what do you want to do with your life? Because he was reading the Word of God, he was memorizing the Word of God, and I said, man, God is planning something big for you. So I found a donor, and we sent him to Battle Creek, Michigan, where he was trained by Louis Therese. He felt like he needed more training, so he went out to Oregon. He, he quit his job, and he went to Oregon, and he's coming here. He has a phenomenal, phenomenal story. But we have, the Cole Porters are getting one Bible study after another. We have a stack of cards for him to, to follow up. Isn't that awesome? Isn't God good? He's really good. Good. So, all the time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for being with us today. Fill us with your spirit, and may the spirit of Jesus be seen in our lives. For your honor, for your glory. Amen.